We pick up the story on Bernie Ecclestone from where we left off last week. It's the late 1970s, and Mr. E is busy owning the Brabham team, politicking with race organizers as the head of FICA, and quietly profiting off all transportation and hospitality for the sport. However, things are about to get a lot more complicated for our man. Flip Jacobson is back to share the second half of the venerable Mr. Eccleston's story. So if you missed the first half, you might want to listen before continuing, but let's not delay any further. Here we go with the rest of the story. This is Garage Easter Radio. Thanks for tuning in. And that's, is that clock? Is that clock going slowly? It is, that's it's clock. Clock. Oh my goodness me, Hamilton's back in position again. A million, a hundred thousand local hearts sink in the grandstands. stood on everything, locked up his tyres, got the line, and he's back into second position on the last lap but one, and the French crowd aren't very happy. In 1978, FICA, the F1CA, became FOCA. This was due to FICA being an Italian swear word. Bernie was made president at last and finally given the title to the power he de facto already had. Bernie, at this point, now he's the head of uh, FOCA. He appoints Enzo Ferrari, il comendatore, as the president of sport for FOCA. Now, what does the president of sport do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But Bernie had learned, you know, we keep Ferrari happy, you know, and things are much easier. During this time also, Mosley becomes Foca's uh, lawyer. Enzo now has another title, and you know, Bernie basically has more power. Bernie is making more power moves centrally, but he's still at the head of Brabham at the same time. So how is the team doing in these years? Brabham, it's, you know, uh, they're not doing so well. They had the fan car, that was great for the Swedish uh, Grand Prix. It, it wasn't really Bernie's thing anymore. He was doing so well running of one that he basically left the team to be run by Gordon Murray. And Murray said that you know, he had run the team for the you know, previous two or three years. Once Bernie accepted the threat that uh, Chapman and the other teams made uh, for, against the fan car, the, the DT46B, basically Murray was done with Bernie. Uh, Bernie built a new factory, um, Murray finally got his full-scale wind tunnel, then he got the, the first carbon fiber production workshop that he had pestered Bernie to, to give him. You know, Bernie obviously doesn't like spending money, but, you know, eventually he, he dealt with one company that he owned and then, you know, he, he got that wind tunnel against another thing and, and eventually Brabham had a new factory with the wind tunnel and produced their own carbon fiber. Even doing that, more power and more money were, were, was going to Bernie because he was, you know, dealing within his own companies. And Murray, you know, as the other team members and managers and, and engineers, he didn't mind. You know, he got his wind tunnel, he's got his carbon production workshop, and he's fine. You know, he, he's back in loving Bernie, and he doesn't care anymore. Yeah, I feel like their relationship, uh, Bernie and Murray, is is pretty symbolic of the other relationships that Bernie had in F1. It's like you enter a negotiation with Bernie and you're probably going to leave the room appeased and, and happy. But then you if you think back to it, it's Bernie's probably much better off than you were. So he makes sure everyone is happy enough not to care. It's funny that when you look back, especially in the, in the 70s, and you know, we're coming to the close of the 70s here, but during this period where, where Bernie, you know, his rise to power, most people don't even realize what he's doing. That's how further ahead he is from everyone else. One team gets, I don't know, more money, and they think, oh, you know, this is great for us. But they don't realize that, you know, Bernie got three other things that he wanted. And he, he was just, no one really could keep up with it. Most people didn't even realize what he wanted to do. And they didn't realize that they were being fleeced by Bernie uh, until much later on. Yeah, of course. 
So back to the politics. How is Balestri making moves um, on the FAI side to, to counter Bernie? Well, uh, the, the CSI had been basically run over by, by Bernie. Um, so FIA, you know, they were not happy that they were again taken for a spin by this upstart. So they, you know, they thought, who are we going to put in power to curtail this tiny Englishman? And that's how, you know, we get Balestri finally. There's a story that the former president of the CSI was, there was this incident with Porsche at Le Mans where Balestri had proof that the previous president of CSI had allowed Porsche to, to race a, a legal car, obviously backroom politics, but eventually here comes Balestri and he's now the president of CSI, which he immediately changes the name to Fédération Internationale du Sport d'Automobile, our beloved FISA. And now, you know, we have Falca and FISA now in place. And, you know, he, he basically wanted to tell everyone that, you know, there's a new sheriff in town and he started changing everything. You know, he changed the number of cars that were allowed in each race. He made going to every race mandatory. You know, Ferrari were renowned for not showing up for some races that they didn't want to go or, you know, if they had won the title or if they couldn't win the title anymore, they would just not show up, especially the faraway races. They just not go. He demanded financial guarantees from the small teams. He changed the licensing for the, for the drivers. He basically was convinced that Formula One was a mess and he was going to be the one to fix it. So with that being said, what happened at the 79 Argentine Grand Prix? Yeah, well, this is the first race after Balestri is, you know, now president of FISA. He basically got the stewards together to make them decide that John Watson, who was racing for McLaren at the time, had been at fault for a crash into Schechter's Ferrari. And so Watson was fined. And he let it slip that he himself had considered uh, suspending Watson. The teams were not amused at this at all. Uh, they were not against some sort of uh, a reprimand for people crashing because, you know, the previous year had seen a lot of first lap incidents. But they were not happy at all with this new, you know, uh, dictatorship coming from the FIA. Balestri then played his card. He told the teams that Bernie had agreed to his punishment of Watson and only reversed course once the teams were in Brazil and started complaining about Foca's lack of action on Watson's punishment. He also claimed that Bernie had been charging 5,000 pounds to issue journalist passes for the year. Um, Balestri's whole thing was to show the teams that Bernie was uh, not defending them, that he was just making money from himself and didn't care about the teams. But, you know, I don't know if he misjudged Bernie or underestimated Bernie, but he was not going to be intimidated, especially by Balestri. He basically crashed a meeting between Mosley and Balestri and told Balestri to his face that Watson would race, he would not pay the fine, and he, that he had the support of the race organizers, because Bernie has always uh, talked to the race organizers and got their uh, agreement. And he also told Balestri that he couldn't complain or else Bernie would start, would start leaking that Balestri had done everything against the wishes of the organizers. Balestri, he's just showing up. FIA doesn't really have that much authority. You know, he got a little bit of authority and he basically caved. Bernie wins round one. Balestri agrees to everything he demanded. He even wrote a statement saying that the fine had been paid and Watson was clear to race. And in addition to that, he says that, you know, every future decision would now be submitted to the Formula One working group. No one knew what this is. No one had heard of it. But, you know, this would eventually become the Formula One commission, you know, that we, we know. And But this was the first mention, you know, and this, this whole thing started because Bernie, basically. <laughs> But Bernie wasn't about to let his power go, and after securing the agreement and support of Enzo Ferrari, declared that FISA would no longer have any power over the organization of Formula One, with the charge resting solely on his group, FOCA. It was a bold political move, and the first true shot in what would become the defining power struggle for Formula One.
The defining fight of the 1980s was not on track, but behind the pit wall, as a control of Formula One hung in the balance. Right. So that, that incident really um, kicked off this FISA FOCA war, um, and it really became the story of the 1980s. So how, how did it progress after uh, that initial race and initial season? Well, you know, as we're moving towards the, the end of the 70s, you know, we now get TV, so everything is a little bit more organized, you know, there's more professionalism being shown. Formula One's global reach is now really getting bigger, they're, they're reaching a lot more people. It was, the, the FISA Foca War was basically a fight for who was going to control Formula One. Ronnie Peterson unfortunately died at Monza in 78 and his crash and this. Um, and Gunnar Nilsson also died around that time. So, you know, Swedish Grand Prix of 79, obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's in danger of not taking place. But this is that deal that, you know, Bernie had negotiated with, with the Prince and the Japanese company sponsoring it. Bernie is keen on, on keeping that race going, but the uh, Hitachi, the Japanese company, had quit. Um, and FISA just wanted to cancel the race. Bernie obviously made a deal to save the race, but then Balestri claimed that uh, FISA couldn't approve the race because it was a last minute deal and it wouldn't be an official Grand Prix and, and the race would have to, to be a non-championship round. Obviously, the Bernie's newfound sponsor was not had any interest in, in sponsoring a non-championship round and, you know, no Swedish Grand Prix of 79. So now Balestri had won a round, you know, made Bernie look bad, showing, you know, that no matter how much power the teams thought they had, you know, FIA still held some of the cards. You know, Balestri then starts pissing off the, the organizer both at Long Beach and Watkins Glen. They, he wants changes to the track, he wants better this and, and less of that, and basically the only thing that they did uh, was siding with Bernie during the earlier uh, fight with CSI before it became FISA. But, you know, Balestri is flexing his, his muscles there. Before the 1980 season, however, Balestri would move to an all-out war, and the future of Formula One would be, not for the first time nor the last, in doubt. Right, so both have kind of won around at this point of this FISA FOCA war, um, but prior to the 1980 season, there were some rule changes that were kind of spurred on by FISA. So what were those, and why were the teams upset about these changes? Well, you know, the, the late 70s is the, the prime ground effect era, you know, the, the lotuses that were glued to the ground and the fan car and all of that. So before the 1980 season, FISA published a report by its technical commission, and that report required massive changes to Formula 1 car design. You know, we're talking weight, length, height, width. But crucial point is skirts with which you know we, we got the ground effect would be banned this obviously costs money right you know, all changes to design cost a lot of money and all the constructors were very unhappy uh, because you know this is going to cost money they don't want to spend that money but uh, there's one car one manufacturer that has a car that surprisingly already fits all this Renault they have a 1.5 liter turbo all the other cars were the ground effect cars if you get rid of the, the skirts and you change the, completely change the design of the cars, you're looking at changing the engines as well. Cosworth had already said that if they were going to make a turbo, it was going to cost double the price. Uh, no team wanted that. And everyone, you know, all the teams are saying, you know, what, why are we doing this? You know, everything's been good, the racing's been good, the, the engines, uh, everyone has kind of has the same engine, so the racing is good, no one's spending a lot of money, why are we doing this? Gordon Murray and, and Patrick Head are basically at the head of the designers and they're saying that removing the skirts is going to have a terrible effect. Um, basically everyone's going to have to remake a car, you know, make a completely new car. The car is still going to go super fast, so that, you know, the old argument that, oh, we need to slow the cars down, that's not going to work, uh, especially, you know, Murray and, and Patrick Head at this point are saying, look, you invented something, you can't put that cat back in the box, you know, we're gonna, still going to use it. And, you know, we, we have this huge fight brewing because basically Balestri is trying to make a move for more power for the FIA. Also, the fact that the only team that would be benefited was a French team just rubbed everyone the wrong way. The FIA had always been ruled by a cast of French nationals and now according to the teams, they were really showing their hand.
So where does Enzo Ferrari come into the equation? Ah, uh, Il Comendatore. You know, Enzo has always been this interesting figure. You know, Balestri wouldn't be changed. He, he just, he's like, well, you know, the Technical Commission has spoken and now we have to implement that. Enzo Ferrari, he had supported Foca. He was, you know, president of sport. He said that, you know, this whole political fighting was making Formula One worse and Ferrari was now thinking of pulling out of Formula One and going back to sports car. Where, where have we heard that before? Schechter at this point is Ferrari's uh, main driver, you know, he just, just won the championship and he was president of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, so he issues a statement as the president of the association saying that the drivers were concerned about the coronary speeds, that the skirts were, were making uh, the races too dangerous. Unfortunately, he hadn't consulted anyone. And a lot of drivers quit the Drivers Association. Bernie's lead driver, it was Nelson Piquet at the time, quit the association. Um, Alan Jones, who would win the title in 1980, and he was the senior member of the Safety Commission, was also not consulted, so he left the, the Grand Prix Drivers Association as well. And Enzo comes up and says that this is all happening because FISA has been weak and allowed teams to do whatever they wanted and run skirts and everything. And, you know, Ferrari and, and Renault are testing their cars and, and showing that uh, the cornering speeds had increased by 40% or, or more because of the skirts and, you know, this is too dangerous. And we still, you know, still Balestri is coming. He then mandates that the, the rims be reduced from 21 to 18 inches. Goodyear and Michelin, they say that they can't produce uh, tires that would be safe. Uh, without the reduction in engine power and downforce, and you know, Balestri ignores them. He then introduces the pre-race uh, briefing. It's now mandatory, and people will would get uh, fines for, for missing it. Also, he then says that cars can no longer be named for sponsors. So, you know, the Lotuses were called the John Player Special Lotuses, but you can't do that anymore either. Yeah, it's Balestri's style of kind of flexing his muscles is really interesting because it's completely opposite to Bernie's kind of method of trying to make friends and make sure everyone's happy. Balestri kind of comes in here, like you said, like the new sheriff in town and, you know, he's putting his foot down and obviously the teams weren't responding very well to that. So all of these power moves that he was making, were those meant to suck the power out of Foca or were there more noble motivations to, to what Balestri was trying to do here? Uh, no, he was using a lot of, just justifying a lot of things uh, on safety grounds. For instance, the ban on skirts, you know, after the whole fight for 1980, they wouldn't be banned until 1982 because, you know, they, they had agreed that any new rule would have a, a two-year notice period. But for 81, the start of the 81 season, Balestri now claimed that the skirts were a safety issue and then they would be banned for the 81 season. It had not been approved by the FISA uh, plenary meeting, you know, they, they, they got all the, the representatives, the, the country's representatives together and they had a, this assembly. It would happen before the, the Rio Grand Prix of 81. And Balestri did it anyway, uh, but he did it for a good reason. He knew that the, all the, the racing associations, the, the country's racing associations would support him. And he would then use that meeting to kind of show them what his plan was, you know, to, to fight back uh, Foca. <laughs> it's funny that the, the skirt ban was approved in this meeting, but it had been rejected in a committee vote, uh, and Balestri just ignored that vote, and you know, just put it to vote for the general meeting and, and carried on. Um, and he said that, you know, before all the other representatives, that Formula One was being run by certain organizations that, you know, private organizations that were not the FIA, and, you know, that had to stop. And he also promised that he would give back control of, of the Grand Prix to the national associations. Um, he would have a, a standard contract and, and everything else. Bernie basically, you know, through Foca just said, yeah, that's not going to happen. Uh, we can't work with that. And, you know, you can't have a model document for all races. And Balestri just you know, kept ignoring him. Balestri was a good politician, very keen on backroom deals and getting his way through any means necessary. Bernie was a street-smart kid with excellent people-reading skills and a lightning-fast brain, 
and a great desire to fight anyone, especially those who looked down on him. The board was set for a fight. We come to the, the Belgian Grand Prix uh, in 1980. So how did that kick off the next fight? <laughs> no one knows how, but uh, Bernie discovered that the regulations never said that the pre-race briefing was mandatory. Balestri had said that, but apparently the, the, the rule wasn't properly written. And, you know, Bernie decided that that was the place. You know, that's where they would make their stand. So all the, the FACA teams skipped the briefing. He's a find them all and they would have two weeks to pay the fine and in two weeks we would have the Spanish Grand Prix and as we're coming up to the Spanish Grand Prix no fines have been paid and you know Bernie got all his teams together and they said that you know oh, if unless the drivers were given their licenses because they were suspended once they were fined no, no team would take part and so you know we have the Spanish Grand Prix and none of the FOCA teams are basically scheduled to race because FISA said they would not give them license, their licenses back unless they paid the fines or not paying the fines, so no one's racing. And now Balestri, who was, in his mind, getting some power back from FOCA, is now in a very, very public fight, which is exactly what Bernie wanted. And it, it's public enough for the, the King of Spain to get involved, so how, how did he try to sort things out here? Spanish king, here's what's going on. And you know, this is two days before the race. So we're up to Friday now. And he basically tells the, the uh, Racing Association of Spain, the Real Automobile Club de España, that it was their job to make the race happen. And you know, obviously you're not gonna argue with the king, you know, the minutia, he just said, do it and you do it. And you know, this, you know, lots of meetings were held. <laughs> including one meeting where there's a famous burning story that you know, obviously no one can prove. Uh, but the legend goes that uh, Balestri shows up to a meeting with the list of his allies, right? And Bernie realizes what this paper is, and he tells Mosley that he is going to flip the table and try to get that paper. So Mosley does that. He flips the table over. Bernie swipes the list. Uh, Balestri is pissed that his list has vanished in all the confusion. Um, and Bernie has the list. Um, and there's no agreement, so there's no race. But, you know, here's the king's cousin, and the king issued an order. The race must go on. And, you know, Bernie goes up to the, to the king's cousin and says, Hey, you know, we're, we're ready to go. You know, our cards are here, our drivers are here, uh, we have a contract, we let go. Balestri is still pissed. And he says that this race cannot happen. Uh, it's not going to come towards the championship, so not non-championship round. And because he does that, everyone from FISA is taken out the track by the local police. But you know, Enzo doesn't. Obviously, Enzo is not there. He never showed up to races. But he tells Ferrari that it doesn't matter. And you know, once the the practice time uh, is here, you put the cars on track and you practice. Ferrari goes out to track. Red flag is shown, you know, everyone, it, it's a whole mess. Then Enzo is pissed. And now Ferrari is saying that unless the other teams pay the fines, Ferrari is not racing. And, and then, you know, this is an illegal race and they can't risk their licenses. And so Renault and Ferrari withdraw from the Spanish Grand Prix. The race was held anyway, and is actually considered one of the best of the year since it had no turbo cars and therefore was very competitive. And a FISA committee later declared that the race would not count towards the championship. This, this whole Spanish Grand Prix is, is just kind of a mess, and uh, I think sponsors started to realize that as well, and they started getting antsy. So how did they try to come in and get involved to resolve these issues, and what was the outcome of that? Uh, the whole fines uh, from the Belgian Grand Prix thing is finally resolved. The teams are forced to pay because uh, they had trusted the Royal Automobile Club of Britain to handle the, the, the appeal, and they made a mistake, and so the teams are forced to pay. Um, so they're pissed now, uh, but Philip Morris gets involved and figures out a way to stop the fight, right? So they get FOCA, they get Colin Chapman, they get three of the uh, FISA vice presidents and Nobel Estri. They come up with a list of 11 points that need to be agreed on. 
So their plan is to send that list to Balestri as a done deal. All the other members of the FISA executive committee would say that they had agreed and that would uh, put the, the matters to rest. Well, it didn't. Uh, that, that plan backfired spectacularly. No one can really say who's to blame to this day, but yeah. So the agreement was faxed to Balestri and somewhere along that line it was also faxed to a journalist and he published it immediately. Balestri never even responded. Uh, you know, everyone was saying that, you know, it's a you did it, no you did it, it's accusations this way and that, that way. Balestri said uh, that he can't move the skirts ban without the executive committee deciding again, even though, you know, the executive committee had rejected the ban, but you know, let's not get facts in the way of a, a good argument. Uh, and, you know, there's no time to get the community together, and basically there's nothing he can do. Meanwhile, Balestri is kind of having these backroom meetings. How, how else is he trying to undermine these? Yeah, well, he's getting the national representatives from a few of about a dozen countries that have Grand Prix to publicly support FISA. Folk at this point is already threatening to stage another world championship, but there is a FIA rule that says that uh, 12 races are the minimum for an uh, international championship. And if you have 12 Grand Prix hosts committing to FISA, Foca basically can't get enough tracks to get a championship together. But let's not forget that Bernie is the one that has the contracts with the tracks. So, you know, he's now threatening the tracks with legal action if they refused to host the Foca races. Basically, this is all going to hell in a handbasket. And, you know, the, the Foca teams are also worried because they're not interested in power. Remember, they're just interested in racing. They want to race and it doesn't really matter. Uh, so they get together uh, with some of the smaller teams, with Ferrari, with Renault, with Alfa Romeo and Balestri to kind of solve everything. And the next Grand Prix coming up is the French Grand Prix. Balestri cannot have that be a problem. Bernie agrees. You know, Alan Jones wins at Bohicard on his way to the championship. And the next day, Bernie and Balestri have a meeting. Bernie presents a no negotiation package. And to everyone's surprise, Balestri agrees. Everyone, you know, no one can believe that this was so easy and okay, let's go and let's get back to racing. Balestri is not done yet. He meets with Goodyear and Michelin and he presents a plan to change the tire construction, the thread design, the diameter, the, the rims, everything. Both companies are not on board with this. Goodyear, Goodyear says that they can accept a reduction in width and diameter. Michelin is not going for anything. And here's Balestri's trick. Since Bernie presented with a non-negotiable package, this cannot be implemented, right? Because, you know, the tire companies can't accept the terms. And so the skirt ban is back on unless the, the FOCA teams agree to the terms that FISA was going to propose and you know they have to agree in about I don't know 50 to 60 days because the skirt ban is coming on uh, at the start of 81. Foca teams were not happy at all because they felt you know rightly that Balestri had played them but in truth they kind of gave him that out and he just took it. As 1981 drew near an agreement seemed impossible and an all-out war seemed imminent. While the Foca teams were planning to use skirts Balestri decreed that teams wanting to race in the 1981 season would have to register by December 1st, and by doing so, would be agreeing to not use skirts. Balestri then threatened to take back control of the races from FOCA, and obviously FOCA, especially Bernie, weren't pleased with this, and they decided that the only way to move forward was to break away from FISA. They then formed the World Federation of Motorsports, WFMS, which would be an independent sanctioning body, under which a new Formula One would be made. Bernie would obviously run WFMS, and race contracts with FOCA would transfer to that organization. As usual, you know, people that pay the bills get to sort out all the mess. And Goodyear, which was not only supplying tires, but was also a sponsor, had already quit. Uh, Philip Morris was again uh, saying that they were going to quit because he couldn't take this uh, pissing match anymore. And, you know, the constructors at this point, they, they still remember the lean years and they know that if Philip Morris leaves and you know, the sponsors leave, that's it. There's no more racing. 
you know, Renault, Ferrari, uh, Alpha, the, the, the manufacturers, they're fine. You know, if they can't race, they'll find something else to do with the money, and they, they're not going to go bankrupt. But the, the what you know, we call the garagists, the podcast team, they know that if if the if the sponsors leave, they're dead. You know, they they can't support themselves. Obviously, Balestri knows this full well. And then you get the politicians. FIA is in France, most of the teams are British, and so, you know, the, the British politicians, especially in that, the, the, the valley that houses all the teams, you know, the motorsport valley, they're not happy, you know. They, these are thousands of jobs that might be lost, and they're blaming on, you know, politics in France, you know, and France and, and, and Britain with their whole story. Bernie is having trouble, you know, in the middle of all this. He's trying to to, to start his uh, competitor World Federation of Motorsports uh, series, but he's having trouble as well because all the tracks now are, are under severe pressure from the FIA. Uh, the FIA had uh, threatened that anyone hosting uh, Bernie's breakout series would be banned from other FIA events. In about six weeks, the, the Bernie's breakout series hosts one race and goes away because you know this this whole situation now everyone is is feeling the pressure so balestri had the support of renault alpha and ferrari but bernie had the contracts with the tracks and the organizers so they for they both have this kind of bargaining chip that can't really be traded so they're at a bit of a stalemate how did things progress from there ferrari is leading the manufacturers uh, position here right they they feel like the skirt ban is going to help them Renault here, by the way, is a problem because, you know, Renault at this point is a government company and obviously Balestri is, is in, in, in league with the politicians, he's trying to, to always trying to get more power. Uh, and so Bernie, um, at the start of the season, he says that they will race in the first three races. But at the same time, he gets an injunction from the High Court in London. Uh, against eight of the, the championship tracks. And this injunction says that they cannot enter into any similar agreement with other parties. So they cannot sign a contract with a FISA, you know, because they have a contract with a FOCA. So if the races don't take place now, it's on Balestri. And he's told flat out by Renault that they are not gonna uh, be happy with this. Um, Enzo? also says that he's not keen on canceling any race and he tells Balestri this and you know at this point uh, Balestri is cornered what he's going to do you know he, he has no way out and he doesn't know but he's about to get in an even worse position. Balestri went to the USA to try and convince the organizers of the West GP to not host the race claiming that the manufacturers were not going to show up. However he failed to calculate the impact this would have on Renault's USA affiliate who had a representative there that day. They got on the phone with headquarters, and before the meeting with the organizers was over, Renault made it clear that they would be racing in the USA, with or without Balestri. Yeah, it, it, it was a mistake by him. I, we don't know if he forgot or he ignored. He should have known that Renault was trying to crack the USA market. If there was a Formula One race and Renault cars did not show up, it would not look good for them. And from that moment on, Balestri's in, in a worse place with Renault and their support for him starts to go down. And obviously, you know, as Renault is going to bail on Balestri, Enzo is not going to be the one propping him up. They all saw that the WFMS race in South Africa, you know, it took place, it was the only race, but they got television coverage, uh, they got press, Ferrari saw this, Renault saw this, and they knew that if Formula One raced in the US and they were not there, it would not look good, look good on them, you know, to be called, you know, that people would say that they were boycotting races, that they were scheduled to compete in, they, they couldn't face that. Enzo, ever the skilled politician, sensed the mood was ripe and called Foca, Renault, and the FIA for a meeting in Maranello. There, under Ferrari's leadership, the Maranello agreement was constructed. Yeah, well, Enzo, he, he's a very skilled politician and he kind of gets everyone together and creates an agreement. Skirts are going to be banned. Any technical changes are going to have to observe the two-year notice period. Uh, the next four years are going to see some sort of uh, rule stability. And FISA would be uh, in charge of making the technical rules, right? Formula One Commission is 
closer to what we we know now you know the constructors and the manufacturers get a little bit more power so we get three constructors three manufacturers four race organizers two of them from europe obviously and a couple of sponsors that are going to have a seat in the commission interestingly maurizio rigobene is the representative for philip morris in the commission during this time you know, now the ferrari team principal the commission is going to make recommendations for fisa and they can reject or accept but cannot amend them ever foca would be given the rights to negotiate with the organizers and promoters for all commercial activities bernie gets his eight percent of the gross income and foca gets the television agreements FISA, the, the FIA would, would have the ownership of the broad, broadcasting rights, but the rights to market would be FOCUS, and they would decide where to, how to distribute that between the teams. It would be, you know, this is, this is beginning of the 80s, it would take until 87 before the FIA would get one penny from the TV rights, and by that time it was a, worth a lot of money. And Bernie knew that this is where the, the power lay, you know, that where the money is, the commercial rights. And then, you know, as this is all agreed, we get finally what was called the Maranello Agreement, but now it's known as the Concord Agreement, which we still have. Rules that are going to change in 2020 that we keep hearing about is the Concord Agreement, and it was first signed in uh, 1981, March 11, 1981. But that's what uh, Enzo finally uh, manages to, uh, to accomplish. And just like that, the war was over. Enzo Ferrari made sure to let everyone know who had brought peace into Formula One, but the ownership of the peace wasn't important, only that it existed. With the dust settling, the teams got back to fighting each other over everything. Chapman introduced the Lotus 88 twin chassis, Gordon Murray had come up with a pneumatic system that replicated 80% of the downforce lost when skirts were banned, it was back to business as usual in Formula One. So just for a little bit of your opinion on how the sport would look different if Balestri was a little bit more of a pacifist when it came to dealing with Bernie and Foca, I mean, you know, would we still have the, the skirts ban? Would, how, how would things have turned out, do you suppose? I think eventually we would move past that. You know, we've seen uh, throughout the history of Formula One that, you know, nothing is ever set in, in stone for long. But, you know, maybe if Balestri had tried a little bit of a softer approach. Maybe FIA would not have lost basically what mattered in Formula One, which is the money it generated in the 80s and 90s. But I honestly, with Bernie involved, I, I seriously doubt that they would come out uh, very much ahead of where they ended up. I don't think anyone could, could, have, uh, could have stopped Bernie. Once he, he set his sights on that, uh, he, was, he was gonna get there. As Bernie was finally legally given the rights to commercialize F1, his power and fortune grew steadily. He made a deal with the TV stations in countries with Grand Prix where they were obligated to show all the races live, charging just a small fee for the transmission rights at first. When the original contract started to run out, the market was set and people were used to seeing F1 races being transmitted live. Bernie used the TV figures that these guys were making possible as a negotiating tactic and demanded ever-increasing payments for the broadcasting rights. Since their local markets now expected F1 to be shown, the TV stations had no choice but to pay up. And so Formula One went from strength to strength, and Bernie, who had by now had his hand at everything connected at a GP, was making more and more money. He was making more money and having more fun being the boss of Formula One than being the leader of Brabham, even if he was only in theory. It was starting to become a problem for him. So he would sell the team off in the mid-1980s, getting himself into another mess before leading with more money than he walked in with, as was his M.O. Once he had the commercial rights under his wing, his power over Formula One was settled, and from then on he ruled it with his customary iron fist in what became known as Formula One Management, FOM, making money hand over fist and expanding Formula One into the global phenomenon it is today. And his reign would go on until Liberty's acquisition of FOM, which effectively ended Bernie's involvement with Formula One. It was a wild ride, for sure. But without him, who could say what would have happened with the sport? One thing is certain, it would be very different, one way or another, and no one could ever replicate the genius and the madness that came from the mind of one Bernard Charles Eccleston.
So what, just just really quickly, what was your favorite Bernie antidote that really didn't fit into the story, but is still a good one to know? Oh, uh, well, there's so many, you know, <laughs> everyone had an anecdote. Everyone had a favorite story, but my favorite story is when he had uh, Graham Hill and Reuterman, uh, the, the Carlos Reutemann, uh, they were squabbling over their engines, you know, they each thought that the other was getting better engines and, you know, this was an ongoing thing within the team, but Bernie didn't really uh, get wind of it until it was really a problem. So he calls the, the team manager at the time, Keith Green, and he says, I want a list of the engines we have. So Green gives him the list and he says, look, I'm tired of these arguments. I, I'm having none of it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to decide the engines for the year. Okay. Okay. So he gets the three drivers in and says, you know, heads or tails, one call each. And he basically flips uh, a coin for each engine. Once they both had their allotted <laughs> uh, assortment of engines, he says, I don't want to hear another word about any engines. Okay. This is done. Leaves, never touches the, the subject again. You know, that's that's his style. He, he sees a problem. He's like, OK, I'm done with this problem. Let's solve this. This is it. This is solved. Goodbye. Yeah. See you. Yeah, it's perfect to cut through the drama that uh, Formula One can have sometimes, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, you know, later he would create a lot of the drama, but always with a purpose. I, I think what he really hated was drama for drama's sake or where he couldn't see a, a, a purpose. That wraps it up for this story from Garage East Radio. I hope it was good to have a new voice in the show. It was certainly a pleasure to have Flip on to tell Bernie's story, and hopefully there is much more of that to follow. Yeah, it was it was my pleasure. Uh, this it's always good to to talk about Bernie and the uh, history of Formula One. It was a pleasure being here, and I hope the listeners enjoy. Our next episode is an interview with motorsport photographer Jamie Price. You can get that episode right in your feed by subscribing to the show wherever you're listening to this. And if you are looking for some extra motorsport content in your social feeds, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Garage East Radio. Thanks again for joining us. Until next time, take care.